now 21. So 20 is extended. Yeah, 20 got extended to 21. Considering that some marks are actually like that. Yeah. So management team. Empty. Yeah. Okay, I, I say let's get going and uh, welcome to the first EEX colloquium of the academic year. Uh, we're starting uh, a little bit early this year because we have a very full program and actually every slot in the program is already filled. So if you want to recommend speakers, we now have to uh, look into uh, 2019. Uh, it, and we're going to have in the middle part of the semester, we're going to have a series of, of speakers who've won the Turing Award which is like the Nobel Prize of Computer Science. And we have one after the other for uh, seven, eight weeks. So uh, that's going to be uh, an exciting uh, uh, diversion this year. Now, uh, joining me as uh, co-chairman of the EECS Colloquium this year, let me introduce uh, Professor Eric Paulos, uh, who uh, is <laughs> deserves a hand. He's taken on the responsibility. He's, he's already brought in uh, some speakers, including today's wonderful speaker. So Eric, why don't you uh, take it and tell us about today's speaker. Great. Wow. I never got applauded for being on a committee before. Okay. That's new. Uh, great. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. I am very excited about this series. Uh, as Eli pointed out, not only do we have a full set of speakers, you're exactly in the right place at exactly the right time for exactly the right information. This is going to be an amazing series. And I will tell you about our speaker. I will hint at, uh, obviously, the ID you already got mentioned. You'll get a chance to see uh, a series of Turing Award winners all talking about and reflecting on their own accomplishments and connections to Berkeley. And I think you'll all be very amazed by those uh, stories and the innovative spirit of all of them. Next week's speaker is going to be Mary Lou Jepson. And for those of you who don't know, she's an amazing innovator. She was faculty at the Media Lab. She was involved with One Laptop Per Child. She's doing creative work. Uh, she was at Google X for a while. She's also doing a project called Open Water with fMRI imaging in the body. And you should come next week to see all the information about that. Um, I'm going to tell you about our speaker now. You see him standing here. So back when I had a lot of hair, I was a grad student here at the same time as Paul. Uh, and yes, I know, it's OK. I'm fine. I'm fine with it. Uh, he was a graduate of the program here. He finished under uh, Professor Jitendra Malik, who has come to further critique his work and will give further evaluations and questioning. So you are never off the hook. Your advisor is always watching over you. He did a work called Facade at that time, which was uh, an amazing look at how you could actually do model-based rendering uh, for architects and photographs. He did a video that was uh, called the Campanile movie, very much in theme with our 150-year anniversary. Fiat Lux. Um, it was beautiful, and those techniques went and inspired many films that you may have seen. Anyone has seen The Matrix, uh, Neo, right? Also Spider-Man, King Kong, uh, The Avatar. If you have enjoyed these films, who's enjoyed any of these films? Yes. Paul had a part in creating some of the effects and helping push the frontier of the technology forward. He's also adjunct faculty at USC's Institute for Creative Technologies, where he's further pioneered this uh, high dynamic range imaging and lighting technique. He's done that for video conferencing and for video uh, capture as well. He also got to go and capture our 44th president, uh, a 3D model that we now have in the National Archives. And he may not remember, but he prototyped on this on me in Krober Hall as a grad student. So I've been telling people I helped like prototype and stand in for Barack Obama. Okay, that's my little claim to fame. Big, uh, he's very much involved with SIGGRAPH. He not only received the significant new researcher award, but he also has played a leadership role at that institute. Uh, um, not only uh, as 
chairing the Computer Animation Festival, which is a huge hit, but also vice president for uh, ACM SIGGRAPH. Now, the other thing is many of us publish work, influence uh, different kinds of communities. Paul, also with his collaborators, was awarded a Scientific and Engineering Award from the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. You can read this as the Scientific and Technical Oscar. That's how I read it. So. Uh, that's pretty impressive to get an Oscar. He's currently at Google VR, where he's a senior scientist doing some extraordinary impressive work, which I think we'll get a flavor of today. And he's going to show us some kind of comfortable, more immersive VR experiences. The main thing I want you to take away is it's a great uh, vision of how Berkeley uh, student r comes up and now I, f I view him as this amazing inspirational person that's not only a scientist, an engineer, an inventor, but very much an artist and a humanist and it's in my honor to introduce Dr. Paul Debevic. like it's less toward mute. Is that good? Excellent. Great. Uh, Eric, thank you for that uh, wonderful uh, introduction. The invitation to uh, come back to uh, uh, Berkeley. Um, this, this is the, the room where I defended my PhD thesis. Uh, these are <laughs> two out of the four people who were in the front row when I was doing it, so there's a bit of a, a, of a deja uh, vu here. Um, a lot has changed. Um, uh, a, a lot has also not changed. There are amazing people <laughs> doing amazing work uh, here, here at Berkeley. And I think what was so special about being here in the late 90s uh, was that there were amazing people doing uh, amazing work uh, back then uh, as well. And uh, my office was in this building. It was in uh, um, uh, many of these people, their office was in 545 Soda Hall. I'm glad even after the remodeling, 545 Soda Hall is, is Still, uh, is still there and exists. Um, I don't think Eric was in 545 Soda Hall, but he would visit sometimes, making it an even cooler place. Uh, I'm not sure how much hair is really on there back in the days. <laughs> But I guess a little more. Uh, and you can see things like a silicon graphics computer that has, um, uh, gosh, I, uh, you know, it was cost $35,000. We had to write a grant for that in order to have something that didn't even have much texture mapping memory. And I think that was like a nine gigabyte uh, disk drive, which I accidentally almost backgrounded a process of R, M, minus, R, F, um, the night before a SIGGRAPH deadline. Unfortunately, killed the process before it took out everything. Um, the, uh, the, the, the thing that Eric mentioned, like uh, my thesis, I was really happy that uh, Jatendra uh, introduced me to a really, um, a really cool uh, postdoc who was working at the time, C.J. Taylor, and got us collaborating together on kind of reconstructing architectural models from, uh, from line segments, and then we could do some projective texture mapping. So we got to kind of twirl around the Berkeley campus uh, as a virtual model uh, for that, and then that got a, a SIGGRAPH paper out there. And then this little animation was the Campanile movie we showed at the SIGGRAPH 97 Computer Animation Festival. And then as the story goes, one of the people in the audience was John Gaeta, who was the visual effects supervisor trying to figure out how to do some of the shots in the Matrix. And he eventually went and tried to do the same kind of photogrammetry captures for, uh, I think, five shots in the Matrix to be the virtual backgrounds uh, that you'll see over there. So that was a pretty good timeline from showing it at SIGGRAPH in 97 to having it show up in a feature film uh, only two years later. And I think the best thing that I did at Berkeley is, I, is, and I'm not sure how other people felt about it at the time, but I stuck around for a while. Um, after graduating, uh, I, I was through Jatendra's good graces able to stay around as a postdoc for a few years. And it was really a magical time because I could still work the computers pretty good myself. There were awesome students to collaborate with. Uh, and then there were just all these sorts of extensions of the work we were doing in image based modeling and rendering that were there to explore. And so uh, with Jatendra, uh, I'd gotten into this uh, thing of trying to take bracketed exposures to put together high dynamic range images. And with uh, Greg Ward, who was at Lawrence Berkeley Labs at the time, and kind of in our environment, uh, I was able to uh, use his radiant system to start using panoramic HDR images to light objects. And that let me, um, again, direct some groups of students to help create the next computer animations that we made, one of which was set in the UC Berkeley eucalyptus grove with an HDR light probe lighting this little 
scene, and then it seemed like, okay, let's try to do something uh, a little bit more impressive. I think one thing that happens, I showed that first one on the left uh, to uh, Michael Namark, if anyone knows who he is, uh, down at Interval Research Corporation. He supervised a summer internship, and he was a really impressive media artist. And he said he really liked this image-based lighting idea, but you know, he didn't think that I'd demonstrate it on anything that was like quite as impressive as what the potential of the technique should allow. And so, you know, kind of being like young and saying, well, well, well I'll, I'll show him, I'll try to do something. So we combined the techniques of facade to do a photogrammetric model of the interior of St. Peter's Basilica, and then put these 24-foot monoliths lit by image-based lighting going down there in a big dynamic simulation uh, to do uh, Fiat Lux uh, for our next uh, film, Let There Be Light, which also just happens to be the motto of the University of um, uh, California, Berkeley. So that seemed to wrap up together. Uh, but in the year 2000, it was kind of time to find something more closely approximating a real job. And there was a new institute starting up at the University of Southern California, so a chance to head to the southern part of our wonderful state. Uh, and there, uh, there were opportunities to continue working in lighting and computer graphics. And many of the things that we did down there had to do with uh, lighting as well, and actually building light stage devices. Now technically the very first light stage uh, was built uh, here at UC Berkeley. Eric mentioned that. He was one of the very first subjects. And I think you can still download a data set of, of Eric uh, to relight, move the light around anywhere using that. The first one was like built out of wood and we'd pull ropes to spin a light source around. You'd have to stay still for uh, about a minute. But really the, the idea behind a light stage was originally that just to try to light a person that's just standing there with one of these high dynamic range omnidirectional lighting environments with the idea that if you're trying to composite them into a scene in some background that they're not actually in, that if you light them with a lighting environment, a panoramic image with all the colors and intensities of light before, uh, and then composite them in that they'll kind of look like they were there and you'll make a believable shot in your movie instead of looking like they're pasted in from a green screen and doesn't really uh, match. And we first published that at SIGGRAPH uh, 2002. We even implemented an infrared compositing system with a beam splitter here. So there's a black cloth that reflects infrared light so you can kind of get a, a mat without a green screen. Uh, and that had a bit of a longer gestation period before it actually got used in the film industry as a filming te filmmaking technique. But that actually did finally happen. There was a, uh, a space movie uh, that came out in 2013. And we were actually contacted about it uh, in, uh, in, in 2010. And they explained, okay, it's this uh, uh, space movie that takes place almost entirely in space. It stars Angelina Jolie and Robert Downey Jr. They both got recast. Uh, <laughs> and um, and uh, they, they didn't quite know how to do it. They knew that the camera was going to be moving around all the time. Uh, people would be tumbling around in different directions. And it wasn't going to be entirely clear uh, how we would really make it look like our actors were out in space. Uh, they knew they could render a lot of it digitally, but they didn't quite know how to do the faces. And the final approach actually did have almost everything rendered digitally, but they weren't quite ready in 2010 to say that they're going to do digital doubles for the two actors. So in this image, you know, Earth is CGI rendered, um, the space telescope is CGI rendered, the astronaut suits are, are computer graphics, the helmets are computer graphics, the visors are computer graphics, the only pixels that were actually recorded by an image sensor uh, are the faces of, of the two actors, eventually Sandra Bullock and George Clooney. And in order to composite them in so that they look like they're there, you've got to film them from the right angle, which they'd eventually use uh, robot arms to kind of move the actors and the camera in the right uh, place. But then you also had to light the actors properly so that they will drop in there and look realistic. So we actually did a test in one of our uh, light stages. Um, I had a, a collaborator. This is uh, Alfonso Cuaron himself, the director, and some of the people from Framestore and some of our crazy camera setups. I had a collaborator I worked with a little bit at Berkeley and then later at USC named Tim Hawkins. And he, in 2008, eventually went 
and uh, started a, a company to commercialize some of the light stage technologies. So this is over at Tim Hawkins's light stage, and we're uh, working with some test actors here. Uh, this is before you know we really had figured out the um, uh, the technology. And here's Alfonso Cuarón, kind of getting used to directing actors who are encaged by lighting systems. Um, and uh, you know we'd put lines in. We'd uh, show that we could dial different lighting conditions on there. We thought really hard about if any of this is ever going to make any sense. Uh, she is now reading lines into the guy who's kind of the stand-in uh, for uh, for the male astronaut. And uh, they put a little astronaut thing on him there. And we also weren't quite sure if it would work, like, because astronauts have been in space for a while, so they usually don't look like they've shaved very recently. But they weren't sure if the lighting would look right on the whiskers or not, so you might be able to tell they kind of did a half and half test on the guy. He's got like stubble on one side of his face, and then it's clean shaven, and then maybe you'd add it in post uh, for some reason. So anyway, based on those uh, tests and a little bit more kind of uh, R&D, uh, they eventually, in uh, London, built a device that got called the, the, the light box. It was a much higher resolution version of a light stage. It was LED panel screens that completely surround the actors. Uh, and they got uh, some robot arm help from a company called Bot and Dolly. So they would basically put the actor in this little rotating basket here. Uh, they would render out the scene that they're going to be in. They actually had to render out the CGI elements uh, of the environments before they shot the principal photography of the actors because they needed to know what kind of lighting was going to be on their faces. And then they would orchestrate this crazy thing where these panoramic HDR images that were rendered in the Arnold renderer of what the light should be like on their face would get displayed on the LED walls and then uh, the uh, actor would be lit by that, they would be composited into the scene. Um, even the scenes where she's kind of like floating through the International Space Station, you know, most of the front of her body is actually from the, the live action plate and you can kind of see uh, over here, that's like the space station uh, all around there. And it's high enough resolution you can actually see what's in the environment. So she could kind of see a handle that she's supposed to kind of mime grabbing onto going by, or she can get an eye line over to like the next spaceship that they're going to go try to uh, find. So these are a, kind of a few renderings uh, that came from the movie. And there they are inside the LED walls. They put diffusers on it there to, to even the light out a little bit more. And then <laughs> all computer rendered with bi-directional path tracing. And it's sort of complicated lighting because you have this huge kind of bluish area light from the Earth. Uh, and then when the sun's then in, in, in frame, then you have to have like relatively uh, bright spotty light from the sun. And in some of the scenes, I think the next sequence is one where she's kind of spinning out of control. And that's one where it's a lot more difficult to imagine. Uh, there's the pre-visualization, how you would really match the lighting on the facial performance to kind of the crazy rotation of like this huge light source of the Earth of the bounce light, and then also the uh, the bright light of the sun happening. So you get a really dramatic scene, and you can you know hopefully believe that they're really out there and really in peril. Uh, so we've actually gotten to continue to uh, work on that problem a little bit, and the most recent light stage that we've built at the University of Southern California Institute for Creative Technologies tried to take our uh, RGB lighting techniques and extend them to multispectral lighting reproduction. There was a realization that when you light people with these kind of controllable RGB LEDs, the color rendition properties are a little funny. And if you don't want to trust that every image is going to go through like you know careful color correction by trained visual effects artists, and you just want to get the right result off the bat of what that person would look like in that environment, you have to pay a little bit more attention to the spectrum of the illumination and the color rendition properties of the illumination. And if you only have red and green and blue LEDs, they're kind of spiky in, this, in the spectral area. So you have a big gap between red and green and a big gap between green and blue in terms of what you're lighting. And what it generally does is it makes people look a little bit more color saturated than you would expect. You can create a metameric color to something that will light a white piece of paper to look like it's white, but then skin tends to kind of look oversaturated or purplish when you, when you do that. So we actually built our latest light stage at the ICT with six different spectral channels, red, green, blue, amber, cyan, and white. And you can buy LEDs for all of these. 
and then that created a problem, which is we had to figure out how do we decide how to drive our six spectral channels. If we're going to go out and take a picture of a mirror ball, for example, um, the image that we get of the mirror ball, which does show kind of the colors and intensities of light coming from every direction, it only shows it to you in RGB, the way that that particular camera picks it up. So what we did is we added these miniature color charts. And if you want a tiny, cute little color chart, you can get one from Edmund Optics. They do cost $200 each, so that's $1,000 worth of color charts right on this thing. Um, and since each one of these color squares has a different uh, uh, reflectance spectrum, they actually tell you, in a low resolution way, a lot about what the spectrum of the illumination is that's coming out there, if it's a daylight spectrum or a tungsten spectrum or where we happen to have placed the thing. And we came up with, in a SIGGRAPH 2016 paper, uh, a way to basically do a, do a joint solve so that we get six channels of illumination coming from all different directions that, if you were to see it reflecting off of a mirror ball, it agrees with the RGB colors on the mirror ball. And if you see it reflecting on a diffuse surface that's pointing in any of the directions that the color charts are, it actually lights the color charts correctly as well. And thus, isn't exactly the spectrum that you'd expect, but it lights the color charts appropriately. And so that's a way of driving our six channels of illumination. And to test that, we did some side-by-side -side testing. So these are our two friends, uh, Jessica on the top row and Janetta on the bottom row. And Hopefully the pictures on the left and right look relatively the same. Uh, and at one point I did have them switched and then I finally noticed that I should put them back. I think they're in the right position now. Um, but basically, uh, this is Jessica actually standing outside of our institute in late afternoon sun and we took a picture of her. And then we put our multispectral light probe out in the scene, captured the illumination. Uh, and then we processed that as quickly as we could, uh, kept her entertained for about an hour while we got the light stage ready, and then brought her up into the light stage. And in the right picture, she's inside the light stage. And we're reproducing that illumination on her. And then we're compositing her into a background. We took the background by taking another photo, just asking her to step out of the scene and get a background plate. And so hopefully, it looks like those two photos kind of match, and we've reproduced the light. And there's zero color correction or any other post-processing going on. These are just literally the two raw images of the camera, both being converted to sRGB for the slide. And then for a very different kind of color temperature or a lighting spectrum, we did shade. And we have uh, Janetta here outside, actually in front of the Institute, and then inside um, uh, the light stage. And she was very nice. We actually, like, for some reason, like, we didn't get the stuff processed uh, in time or we're having some trouble with the light stage. So she actually came back the next day, did her hair the same way, did her makeup the same way, put on the same shirt, and then tried to do the same pose. She did an amazing job, I think. And then the lighting matched on her uh, pretty well. So that was kind of the vision of a light stage is that it would be a way of basically taking these HDRI maps and lighting people with them. And it felt good that we could get this right even in the real world where there's an entire spectrum of illumination. Uh, but that's actually not the biggest way that the light stage has actually gotten used uh, out there in uh, industry. And once we had gotten in our light stage 5 system, which started as the light stage 3 system with the RGB LEDs, once bright white LEDs became available. Um, we instantly kind of decorated that same structure with these bright white LEDs. And we can blink them on super fast. They're like, you know, basically transistors. And uh, you, you can uh, do good pulse width modulation, get different intensities. Um, but at some point, I started wondering if we could turn this into a useful facial scanning system to try to get good 3D models of faces that people who were trying to create a digital actor could use as like the blend shapes in order to, to, to do that. And the problem is, is that most of the facial scanning systems that were out there at the time were like a cyberware laser scanner, which doesn't get a very high resolution scan. Because that laser light scatters within the skin, you're really limited to like a millimeter or two of resolution. And that doesn't get skin texture. It doesn't get pores and fine creases. And so I was trying to think, is there an optical way that we can reveal this detail of the pores and the creases, and then use that to increase the resolution uh, of our scans if we're going to get those through uh, stereo. And the uh, technique ended up involving putting polarizers on all of the light sources and 
photographing the face uh, twice, once under cross-polarized illumination from the entire sphere, and once under parallel polarized illumination from the entire sphere of light. And then back in the day, we do some structured light patterns to get the basic 3D geometry. Uh, nowadays, that's just a big photogrammetry solve, and then we get the high resolution surface detail uh, from the photometric measurements. And it's kind of like a spherical form of photometric stereo from like the, the classic work from the 1980s. Uh, but it's independent of wherever you want to put the camera, so you still don't need that many lighting conditions. Uh, so if we look at these closely, this is uh, an actress, Emily O'Brien. She is lit from every direction light can come from, but we've cross-polarized out the specular reflection. Since the lights are all polarized essentially vertically here, um, the reflection off the skin, the specular reflection, the shine of the skin stays polarized because it's kind of like reflecting off of a mirror. But the light that scatters into the skin, uh, refracts in, scatters around, and refracts back out, depolarizes. And so that can actually make it at least half of it through the polarizer. So we get an image of basically their subsurface reflection, and that produces a nice diffuse texture map. If we switch the polarizer on the camera really quickly, it brings the specular reflection back in. And if we take the difference between these two images, where the subsurface, since it's depolarized, stays about the same, the specular comes in and out, it gives you an image of only the specular reflection off of the skin coming from all those directions. And since this is a first surface reflection that didn't have any scattering to it, it actually gives you a very uh, high resolution detail map of the shape of the face. In particular, all you have to do is light it from a couple of different directions. And these are sort of the first four spherical harmonics, gradients of light, uh, right to left, forward to back, and top to bottom. And I'll go back through these again. You can see that watching how the light plays off of the face reveals a lot about the fine grain pore structure. And in fact, with some pretty simple math, you can compute which part of the light stage was reflecting in each pixel that you see based on the pixel values you get across the sequence. And from that, you get the reflection vector, you reflect halfway back toward the view vector, and now you have a surface normal estimate, which you can turn into a surface normal map. And now if you have basic geometry from like a structured light scan or from photogrammetry, then you can effectively jointly solve for a shape that obeys these photometric normals and all of the photoconsistency constraints from the different views. And you can turn a scan that might have been kind of a smooth one into one that actually has this kind of skin detail that you can see. And we'll zoom in on these in a little bit. So this is actually from a project that is kind of experiencing its 10-year anniversary, but I'll, I'll, I'll quickly show uh, the, uh, the result because we were, we were excited to be able to see, to show a face that was as realistic as this back in 2008. We collaborated with Image Metrics on this thing called the Digital Emily Project, and it was a face replacement. Um, the body and the hair and the ears are all real, but we actually uh, completely computer rendered the face on top of our original performance just to see if we could actually create an image of somebody that was that realistic. So she has a diffuse component and a specular component and an animation mesh that they used with the, uh, the, uh, the image-based uh, performance animation uh, technique. And that was kind of a cool r result um, because it wasn't exactly clear how to create digital faces that would look as real uh, as you might like. Um, that did use the high resolution detail uh, textures. We've since also gotten uh, interested in trying to really get even better than tenth of a millimeter detail for the skin. And we've built some frightful looking devices that we put inside our light stage um, that are uh, imaging the shape of skin at uh, about hundredth of a millimeter detail or 10 micron detail. And um, you know, just kind of like stuck in traffic, which happens in LA too. Um, I, I noticed looking in the rear view mirror that like skin actually changes its microstructure quite a bit when it stretches and compresses. Uh, and so this uh, paper from SIGGRAPH uh, 2015 uh, measured and then created a model of how skin microgeometry actually changes its uh, anisotropic reflections and its, and its microstructure uh, just as you go through different facial expressions. And we worked on simulating a more accurate version of that to have um, dynamic skin that looks a little bit more realistic. So this is an animation of Digital Emily that we did just a couple of years ago, or back in 2015. And we're actually adding a microgeometry layer onto it as well. And uh, that helps the skin look a lot more realistic.
uh, nowadays when the, the movie industry people come by and they bring our, uh, the uh, actors to get scanned in our uh, system, they'll often also ask for these microgeometry scans as well, which they can use to kind of up res everything to hundredth of a millimeter detail. Um, so the first film that used the high resolution facial scanning uh, project uh, was a small independent feature. I mean, no, it was uh, <laughs> the, um, it was actually Avatar, uh, which was exciting. And uh, we had worked with a guy named Mark Sagar on the Spider-Man 2 film with an earlier light stage process. Uh, and he was actually a New Zealander. It had gone back to New Zealand. And he saw an early result of this uh, uh, skin uh, pore structure, the, the high resolution displacement maps we could get from the light stage uh, back in 2006. And very quickly after that, they started sending the actors from Avatar, which were filming at a facility like only a mile from our institute. And we got scans of them. So when you see folks like uh, the character Neytiri here, she's based closely on a scan of Zoe Saldana. Um, they kind of restructure her nose to turn her into a Navi rather than a person. But the uh, animation works as well as it does because it's really basically Zoe's face, her lips and her jaw and all of those facial expressions we can get uh, from, the, from the light stage that she's driving. And so in a scene like this, this is a completely computer rendered Neytiri. Uh, something that's not as well known uh, is that the Sam Worthington character, Jake Sully, is also completely computer rendered in this shot uh, as well, based on scans of Sam Worthington. And in the scene, she kind of leans down to give him a kiss. There's shadowing between the faces. There's bounce light between the two faces. And even though they certainly could have shot him on a green screen laying there and then added everything in post, if you wanted it to look real and like everything is in the same scene, it's a lot better if they're both digital and then you can put them part of the same lighting simulation and have a lot more artistic control over everything until the shot looks just the way that you want it to. Uh, so these techniques have been used in, actually it's almost 40 movies uh, since then through several light stages. And I won't go through all those applications, but one I did wanted to highlight was kind of a more, um, you know, a, a more weighty uh, use of the technology, which happened for a film that, you know, you wouldn't think of being a particularly serious film, but the application of the technique was a little bit more serious, and that was for these, uh, for the film Furious 7. So it's the seventh in these, you know, crazy driving heist movies um, starring Vin Diesel. And as it turns out, um, Halfway through filming uh, Furious 7, Paul Walker, who is one of the characters from the beginning, uh, the actor was killed as a passenger in, in a car accident, very tragically. And they had shot about half of his scenes, and they had half of his scenes that they hadn't, hadn't recorded yet. And so production shut down. We had actually already been, you know, kind of contracted to start doing facial scanning, and we hadn't scanned Paul Walker, unfortunately. Um, and we kind of assumed the whole project was going away. And then as it turns out, uh, his family said that if there's a way to complete this film so that you can take you know, his final work and get it out there in front of the fans, we would be happy to assist with that. We'd be okay with that. Uh, and as it turns out, Paul Walker has two brothers. Uh, and they are uh, Cody Walker and Caleb Walker. And uh, they don't look too far off. Actually, Caleb Walker is only a couple years younger than Paul, and uh, kind of the top half of his head is a pretty close match. Uh, and, um, and then his chin gets a little bit too thin. But then uh, Cody, who's quite a bit younger, he's got more of the jaw structure. So if you sort of see him like from over the shoulder from behind, you might think that that's Paul. So they actually, both of them like trained with Paul Walker's trainer. They both got the haircut, they got the stubble, um, they got in shape for all of this. And then we did extensive scanning of them, both with and without the, the beards. They actually shaved in the middle of the day and then we rescanned them. And all of this data went down to Weta Digital. And, you know, I, I, I should really emphasize we're the first part of the process of creating photo real digital actors. We're giving you good data to work with. There's tons of technology and artistry downstream for the animation, for the rigging of the characters, for the rendering of everything uh, that Weta Digital accomplishes. But we try to start them with good data. And based on that, and then a lot of effort on their part, they were actually able to create a a, a really gosh darn photo real version of Paul Walker's head um, that uh, frequently they'd have Caleb Walker um, you know, who's not an actor, but you know, there were acting coaches trying to help him through all the scenes. He'd perform the scene, and then they would do a total head replacement over Caleb Walker to do the final shots. And the movie press, you know, the, the, the executive producers, including Vin Diesel, um, 
they didn't want it to become the story of this film that it's a milestone in CGI of creating digital actors. They wanted to have the story be that this is Paul Walker's final film and come enjoy his final performance and don't think too much about how it was how it created. So the visual effects really, like this thing didn't even make the list of 10 films considered for the Oscar for best visual effects, which is kind of crazy because it was by far the best digital actor uh, done at the time and I still think it's, it's the high point in terms of the extensive use of a digital actor. 300 shots of the film had the digital Paul Walker in it and then this is a sampling of shots where uh, Paul Walker is, 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 is digital. Vin Diesel's real. So that was an exciting project. We did the scans around uh, 2014 uh, for that. And uh, it was a good time for, for light stage stuff because that's also when we got the call from uh, the people at the Smithsonian uh, Institution. Um, I had given a talk at their 3D scanning conference that they had in late 2013. And uh, I showed them some of the work we had done on, on avatar and facial scans and also some of our other work we'd done in cultural heritage like the, the Parthenon and, and uh, some of the object uh, reflectance scanning stuff we'd done. And um, the uh, people at the Smithsonian had a 3D digitization program and one of the things that they had done is they had scanned plaster casts of Lincoln's face. There's actually two life masks of President Lincoln, one right before he got into office and one about a month before he was assassinated. And these are pretty famous data sets. They did a scan of them uh, and they made them available on the Smithsonian 3D scanning website. And then they got the idea that, you know, we haven't really gotten a 3D record of a president since Lincoln and maybe it's time we did that. So they asked us is there any way we could bring our light stage to Washington DC and do a very special scan over there? And um, it wasn't immediately clear how to get our big ball thing through the door and into a shipping container and all of that. Uh, but what we did do is spend a, a pretty active Memorial Day weekend in 2014 basically building a structure and grabbing uh, light sources um, as best we could off of the light stage. Um, we couldn't do a full sphere, but we tried to do a good arrangement that would get all the surface normals measured uh, in, 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 a, in a little bit of an effort to, to try to increase the patriotic nature of this. I actually chose the arrangement to have exactly 50 light sources on it. Um, and then uh, this was designed so that it could uh, fold up, go in a crate that could ship in an airplane, potentially open up and go through a single doorway because it the first we were going to do it in the west wing of the White House and then they actually moved it to a different location. Uh, and then we got it to DC, we tested it in the uh, Smithsonian office for, uh, for a little while and then it was time to take it to the White House and the way you do that is actually you put it on a truck that you rent and you back it up to the front door of the White House. <laughs> you don't go straight there, they look in the truck and everything like that beforehand and things like that. They, um, uh, ch check that out. But, uh, and, and you can't, it has to be a nice white truck. You can't have like logos on that or anything. Um, so we set it up there. We had the data to, to test. And then the next day uh, we came back um, and uh, we did one more test. Uh, I am apparently, like my height is apparently exactly the, the, the same height uh, of, 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 of the person we needed to scan. So we kind of just framed on me. And usually when we have someone come to our lab, even if it's Angelina Jolie or Tom Cruise, like we don't have any problem making them wait for 15 minutes while we focus cameras and jitter with lights and test if the thing works because they're actors and that happens to them all the time with people and camera equipment. And here it's like, you know, no, we've, you know, this has got to go efficiently. So it's pretty much sit in the chair uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and do the scan. And probably the most nerve wracking thing was realizing he's gonna sit in a chair and then we have to get him in exactly the right spot, like 
his head exactly where my head was, if, or otherwise things aren't going to focus. We don't have time to focus these cameras. So we framed so tightly that if he was in frame, he was in focus. And the only way we could adjust him, his position, is literally had to roll him around on, in the chair <laughs> on the thing. And this fell to me to do. A, to explain to him what we were going to do, and then I had to grab the back of the chair and actually and push him in, looking at the screens to where it works. So after two adjustments, uh, got him in frame. And then this is kind of, a, kind of how that thing went. We had to dress up a little better than we usually do for work. <laughs> we got a, a GoPro on there. You can see right behind him, is the White House photographer Pete Sousa. He just put his camera down. And even though I wasn't able to meet with Pete, I did everything possible to try to make it so that he could get a good photo of this. Because, dear gosh, I wanted there to be a good photo of this thing. And uh, that photo is here. Um, they actually put it in front of the portrait of Lincoln to make that connection. And the Smithsonian people brought an extra light source that they weren't using for anything. So I mounted it on the back of the rig there just to light the portrait of Lincoln. So Pete Sousa, you're welcome. <laughs> um, and uh, we actually had 14 cameras on the thing. We had three Canon Rebels and then eight of our Canon 1DXs from the, uh, from the light stage. And the 1DXs uh, recorded all of the different uh, polarization conditions. So these are the cross-polarized images or the parallel polarized images. We just did one cross-polarized image and uh, did a bit of a color space analysis to help that out. Um, and from that, we got the high-res surface normals. And then during the time that we had access to the data, in fact, by that evening, we processed everything and we were able to do uh, a pretty good rendering of uh, what we recorded for that. And so we got the face ear to ear after he was in our system. He went and sat in a different chair. And the Smithsonian folks had an Artec EVA scanner that's handheld. It's not as high res. But they got the back of the head and the shoulders. And the pitch to the White House is that they were going to kind of underscore their 3D printing mission that uh, Barack Obama had uh, mentioned in the State of the Union address early in the year. And so. Within nine days of that, they'd actually managed to combine the models and do a, a uh, 3D print uh, of all of that. And they brought that back to the White House <laughs> <laughs> to a somewhat amused 44th president who seemed to eventually kind of warm up to the thing and uh, Don't do did. This for 45. Yeah, there, there, there's currently no plans to do it for, uh, for, for, 40, for 45. And that he was also very nice to, uh, and someone got a little print of it. I don't know. I'd like one of those too, but we're told we're not supposed to do that. Um, and, that and Barack Obama was also very nice. We asked for no makeup as well. And on State of the Union dresses, he'll actually wear makeup, which evens out his complexion a lot. But we actually got him completely you know, without, without makeup. I don't know if we would get that with anyone else, actually. Um, so, uh, so that was kind of a kind of a highlight. The most recent kind of movie highlight uh, was kind of a cool uh, cool project, and this is sort of the last application I'll mention. Uh, but there was a film where they they kind of did a sequel to uh, Blade Runner from 1982 uh, called Blade Runner 20. 49, and uh, they actually used the light stage in two ways to try to combine two actors into one digital character. And one of them was for these two uh, uh, female characters named Joy and Mariette. One of them is, is, is actually a hologram in the film, and in a kind of a special scene with Ryan Gosling, they kind of stand in each other's spaces and they merge into a third actor. So they actually scanned both Anna de Armas and Mackenzie Davis, and those high-res scans of them went to um, double negative uh, visual effects company and they created an intermediate version of the two so as they're cross dissolving between the two actresses they can actually land on this kind of combined actor that's like half one and half the other uh, in creating a pretty cool uh, scene for them. Uh, but the one that I thought was kind of the more exciting use is that they decided that this film should have uh, the character of Rachel uh, in it as well. And she was uh, played by Sean Young uh, in the 1982 version. Uh, and she was a very young woman. She was like 20 years old uh, in that version. And so uh, since none of us look like, the, like we did when we were 20, except for the 20-year-olds in the audience, um, you know, they, they would have to use some CGI to do that. So uh, they actually um, cast a British actress named Lauren Pita, who is a good actor, has maybe a very passing resemblance to Sean Young. Um, 
and uh, we did uh, quite a bit of documentation of her, and she was basically going to be like a skin donor to this digital character. Um, they uh, got her into the light stage, they put her in the right Rachel makeup, which is also pretty iconic. Uh, and you can see my graduate student, uh, Chloe Legendre, there helping her into the skin microgeometry system. And um, 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 we also got to scan Sean Young herself, who's uh, I think uh, was 57 at the time. Wonderful person that helped get basic bone structure and some of how the facial expressions work. And again, all of this data just goes to incredibly talented visual effects people who do tons of stuff after our uh, parts of the process. But they were able to create this shot. This is kind of a breakdown, and we'll. The head's going to disappear, and then we'll see bone structure. This is creepy, but um, eventually it's a complete computer graphics uh, rendering uh, of the head that you can see. And for me, I had to you know, wait like a year and a half not telling anybody about any of this stuff until the movie came out. And when the scene finally came on, it's like, okay, I went into total analytic mode. Let's check for subsurface scattering and Fresnel <laughs> reflection and asperity scattering and, and all of the other things. And as it turns out, like, they did such a good job on the animation and the emotion of the scene that after the first shot, it just pulled me back into the story. And uh, I had to wait for the Blu-ray to get really analytical about it. So <laughs> all of those folks were, uh, uh, were really good. So we're kind of running out of a little bit of time. So I'm going to kind of skip forward to uh, our final thing here, because I want to talk about at least something that I've done uh, at Google, um, which has to do with light fields. And um, light fields are trying to capture environments just as realistically as we're able to capture faces. And uh, these are some uh, sequences of images that look like maybe we just put a camera on a track and pushed it through the scene, which we certainly could have done and it would have looked like this, but they're actually all light field rendering. We started by going to these various scenes, including inside Space Shuttle Discovery there, and taking photographs on a spherical surface to capture all of the rays of light coming into a small volume, and then using light field rendering, which we saw presented at SIGGRAPH 96 by Stanford and uh, Microsoft uh, and, and, and other places, um, you can reuse rays of light of the scene coming into the sphere to render images that are inside the sphere. And the particular application we were thinking about was to create virtual environments for VR that actually let you move your head around in the scene and look around objects, see reflections, go over surfaces, and most importantly, just react to how you're moving your head so that you don't throw off your vestibular system by telling you that the whole world is attached to you and moving with you, which makes a lot of people kind of nauseous. I'm quite, I, I, I'm, I'm very attuned to that and it, it doesn't make me feel very comfortable either. Um, we didn't immediately buy that many GoPro cameras. Um, that would be a little bit hard to deal with. So, so far we've mostly stuck to static scenes and have a subset of the GoPros and we put them on motors and we rotate them around in order to capture all of the rays of light coming into a sphere. And then this image here is basically showing how light field rendering works. We didn't capture any images inside the sphere, but that's where we need to render to for the VR headsets. So if you need to render a view from here, well, this pixel here got seen by this camera up here coming from that direction because you know nothing got in the way over here. So you just grab that pixel from that camera, grab this pixel from that camera, this pixel from that camera, and this pixel from that camera, and you can build an image that's completely correct for this perspective. And if you need rays that came in between any of these, then you use some view interpolation with depth maps and you can put it together. So kind of our hero scene was, again, from our friends at the Smithsonian that we worked on for that uh, presidential scan. They called me up and said, hey, we're documenting space shuttle discovery. Uh, would you like to shoot light fields inside the space shuttle? And I said, well, hmm, let me think about that. <laughs> and no, of course I want to shoot light fields inside the space shuttle. That sounds great. So we actually brought our thing there. It was kind of designed actually a bit in order to fit between those two seats, because that would have been embarrassing if uh, it had, uh, it had uh, bonked into you know, space shuttle parts and stuff. And the way that the renderer works, I got to work on this project with um, kind of a San Francisco team at the Google office, uh, Ryan Overbeck, Dan Erickson, and Dan Evangelikos. And they had a uh, technique basically of disk-based rendering. So each one of these disks represents one of the cameras that was in that sphere. And 
the area that you see rendered in is the area that we're going to use for that camera in order to generate this part of the virtual view. Now you see it as disks because we've intentionally shrunk them down to the point where they don't overlap so you can see kind of how the image is being created. But if you then increase the size of those disks a little bit, then you'll see that you can actually generate arbitrary views of the scene and see reflections change around, see all of the motion parallax. And if you put on a VR headset, it's really as close to being there uh, as you can get. I enjoyed being inside the space shuttle. I was very preoccupied with uh, making sure equipment worked and exposure values were good and I had to put all the lights in place too, which is hard to hide. Uh, and it was like really early East Coast time, so I'm a little fried out anyway. Um, I'm happy that any time in VR I can put on a Vive Pro and I can just be back there and I can still have that moment of what it was like to be in the flight deck of the, uh, of the space shuttle. We also experimented a bit with portraiture as well. This is a, uh, an artist couple in Venice, California who've decorated the entire outside of their house with little bits of ceramic and mirror, which is kind of like a, kind of a dream light field, right, with all the reflections and such. Um, we thought we should record them as well. So we actually had them pose for a photo with the, the, the device. And the question though is like, well, where do you tell them to look, right? Normally you say, well, just look at the camera. There's lots of cameras and they're moving around. So I shot one of these where I just told them, try to look at this, uh, this little pink tape that's right here in the middle on the post. And if you look at that light field, they're kind of like just sort of catatonic looking straight into space and you can kind of walk into their field of view and then walk out and it's just like you're not there or anything like that. So the other way that uh, I shot this is I told them look at the green tape which is kind of on the middle camera and there's green tape on the front and the other side of this too so they can kind of just follow it around. It's actually a lot easier to stay still if your eyes have something to follow and that you're not having to worry across your field of view. And so the result is that when you're in the light field, they're kind of always looking back at you. And I'll play this here, and maybe you can tell. They're kind of going back and forth. And this was a completely different way for it to be creepy, we found out. Um, I think it's the better way to do light field for Like as we work up to doing full light field video, I think it's the better way to do for because they do feel much more present in the scene and aware uh, of you. So if any of you are interested in experiencing uh, light fields, there is a free download application called Welcome to Light Fields on the Steam VR store. Um, and uh, it's got uh, the space shuttle, it's got the gamble house, the tile house, uh, St. Stephen's Church. Uh, Sherry and Gonzalo make an appearance at the end. Uh, there's like 35 light fields. Uh, uh, and uh, it's free to experience and uh, you know, please give some feedback uh, if you have that and hopefully I'll get to keep working on this kind of stuff at Google. So with that, I think we're out of time, so let me just say thank you very much. Okay. Amazing, thank you. Uh, I know there's there we, we're just at time, but I want to have time for a couple questions. So if, if folks have questions, I will run around with the microphone. Um, I'm sure there'll be some. Uh, can we have Paul Walker live forever or create uh, new superstars out of thin air that get inserted, that get you know uh, market tested to be the best person for that role? Yeah, uh, so that's a really good question and um, you know, as, as a lot of people in the room are aware, I think the things that I've talked about are going to be known as the classical approach to creating uh, digital human characters and, and digital actors and uh, we are going to see within the next decade deep learning based techniques that you know, will be much closer to the vision of you just take you know, every shot of every, you know, Furious movie and throw it into a big hopper and then ask it to, you know, replace, you know, your stand-in actor with that of, with that of Paul Walker. And, you know, we've seen things like, uh, like we, we scanned a, a Michael Jackson impersonator so that they could do like a Pepper's Ghost performance of him for the, for the, uh, for the Billboard Music Awards. We see people trying to work on bringing back Elvis and, and, uh, and uh, put Marilyn Monroe in a new film. And, I think there is some value in that because if you're trying to introduce like a, a, an artist like to a new audience who hasn't seen all of their movies, but you can have a way of kind of encapsulating and embodying you know all of all of their work into some into some kind of composite form, some new form that is based on what they did do in their life. 
that could be like another, you know, maybe like window into their world of like, oh yeah, I want to learn more about, you know, what they were in in all of these different films. But you can never like really extrapolate to how they would have been affected by new events or how they would have you know continued to evolve as an artist and you can also never really predict how they would have um, you know approached a new role when they were building the digital Paul Walker there's lots of uh, uh, interview footage of him uh, being interviewed by uh, talk show hosts right like every time a movie comes out there's a press circuit and such they found that that footage of him, of Paul, of Paul Walker, was not useful in creating his character in these movies. I think his name is Brian Connor or something like that. Um, because he's actually in character as Brian Connor in the films, and he acts and sounds different than when he's just being Paul Walker. So to think about how this actor would approach a new role in a new movie, you know, Marilyn Monroe wouldn't just be the same character as in Some Like It Hot. Um, and we'll kind of will never know what she actually would have done. So we want to put those caveats on everything. Good question. Hi there. I was wondering, what is it going to take for this type of technology um, to be available on a smartphone? <laughs> well, I get that question a lot. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Let's see. Well, I have a, I, I have a, co I have a colleague at USC who, um, named Hao Li, and uh, he, he's working on. It. There's some app that he's got a startup company called Pinscreen, and they, and you know I've got it on my iPhone 10. It takes a picture of you, uh, hallucinates the shape of your face, hallucinates the expressions of your face, uh, makes you wear funny clothes and dance funny dance moves because that's what you do with these kinds of things. Um, and it's not perfectly photo real yet, but it's way better than we thought was possible two years ago. And where that's going to go two years from now, uh, it might impress us. It might even scare us. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So this might be uh, similar to the first question. <clears throat> I'm trying to imagine the future career of an actor. Mm -hmm. uh, you go in and you you go to school, you uh, uh, you enter graduate school, and uh, right maybe right around the time you're uh, 21, 22, you go in for your total scan, mm -hmm. and you have your data set, and then you go back to your career. You go for a PhD, whatever else, but then for the rest of your career, all you do is rent out your uh, facial scan. Yep. Okay. Yep. And that's the new career for an actor. <laughs> <laughs> that, you that can become a brain surgeon. You can do anything you want, uh, but you've you've done your acting. Great work if you can get it right. So um, I think that's going to be possible. Certainly like doing uh, like reshoots of scenes. Sometimes they edit the whole movie together and they realize uh, if they could have said this line of dialogue, this extra line, now the story would finally make sense. And then they don't want to bring back the actor and have them react stuff. There, there's there's this, this, this crazy situation with the, uh, uh, the Justice League movie, which is that the guy who played Superman in, Justin Le in Justice League uh, they needed to do reshoots of him to fix the story, but he was already going to work on the Mission Impossible film with Tom Cruise, and he had a beard in that movie. And he was contractually obligated to have that beard. <laughs> so they brought him back for reshoots for uh, Justice League with the beard and the mustache. And so it's Superman with a beard and a mustache saying his lines, and then it like literally was $10 million of visual effects work to then do a digital actor for his jaw and it was rushed enough that it wasn't perfect and the internet got a hold of this and had a field day and that probably didn't help the, the, the film Justice League. So it would have been much better if um, uh, you know, the, 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 the actor could have like, gotten the lines of dialogue, just recorded it on the cell phone and then um, you know, had that transferred to the digital actor with like, faithful technology to just make that work and then that would have been a much more convincing way to do that. Um, I think a lot of what you see in good performances by good actors in movies is because they are there on set with the other actors, working with the director, and there's that, um, you know, that extra like adrenaline seriousness of no, like, hey, we've really got, you know, like the, the cameras are rolling. It's like, let's get this right now. Just like, you know. Any of you could watch my talk, you know, later on the recording. But you came here today to be part of this event, and it's going to, you know, have you paying more attention because it's happening live. I'm 
giving a, a, a more animated and better talk than I would if it were just to, you know, two people in the front row because there's all the energy of the audience here. And so I think that the magic of putting scenes together to film in, in, in a movie is still best going to be with all the actors getting together. But they might be wearing mocap suits, right? And we're seeing more and more of that where uh, films like, you know, Ready Player One have whole scenes that take place in the virtual world. Uh, and they eventually become computer renderings, but they're still working together as actors. Uh, they just get to be closer to their families and go home at 6 p.m. And um, not too many people are complaining about that. Okay, let's take one more here. Sorry, just really quick. I was just curious what the fourth picture was about. What the what? The fourth picture. The um, fourth picture here. That's yeah. what I skipped over, and I'm so sorry I, I, I had to do that. But uh, we've actually been working on a variety of techniques. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly go back to just, just the, uh, the lead image there. We, we've been working on um, various kinds of sort of like hologram display projections. And um, we did a project in one of our big light stages with the USC Shoah Foundation uh, to record like week-long interviews with survivors of the Holocaust, actually, of the World War II. They're, they're getting quite old. One of them that we record is actually passed already. And um, we record them from multi-view video. We have it lit in a special way in the light stage. And then we can actually um, do a uh, kind of a view interpolation holographic solve of this to take their interview. So if somebody asks them a question, uh, they actually show up as a, a life-size auto-multiscopic image uh, that's projected. There's like 200 video projectors behind, and it gives you this, uh, this, this is no visual effects, it's just a real video shot with a little camcorder. Uh, the appearance of this life-size 3D person in front of you that's looking at you and, and uh, you know, if you're sitting in the right place, you feel the eye contact. And our natural language group made it so that the question that you ask gets uh, analyzed and it plays back the closest response that's likely to be a good answer uh, to the question. And we hope to get this into virtual reality so we can get it more out there in the future too. Great. Thank you. I'm so glad you shared that project because that's really inspirational, I okay. think. So let's thank yeah. our speaker again, Paul DeBevick. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I think if you want to ask him some questions, he'll stick around a little bit then. We have to steal him away, but uh, please do that. And we'll see you next week. You're on the schedule. You have the rhythm. Same place, same time. We'll look for you. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. 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 Thank you.